This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Welcome to this episode of The Caregiver's Dilemma. The Caregiver's Dilemma is dedicated to bringing awareness to the experience of caregivers from all walks of life and to share valuable resources to make the caregiver's journey a little bit easier. Make sure to stay tuned to the end to get information and resources related to today's episode. Thanks for listening. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of The Caregiver's Dilemma. I'm your host, Amelia Borland, occupational therapist and owner of Higher Standards Caregiver Training. And I am delighted to introduce our guest here today. This is going to be a resource intensive episode. I hope that it will introduce some things to you as a listener that maybe you weren't aware of that are resources for you, hopefully in your local area. This is stuff that honestly as I'm embarrassed to say, as an occupational therapist, I wasn't aware that all of these resources were available until I really started digging and doing more homework about it. So I'm excited to introduce you today to my guest. This is Donnie Green. Donnie Green has led the North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging for more than 25 years. Wow. Donnie knows what she's talking about, y'all. She has a master's degree in gerontology from Baylor University. I will go ahead and let Donnie say hello here. Hi, Donnie. Thanks for coming on to The Caregiver's Dilemma. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you today. So let's dive right in. And I'll start with just saying I'm a little embarrassed to say that I wasn't aware, even as a professional, as an occupational therapist, I wasn't aware at all of the number of resources that are available to people through their local area agencies on aging. Can you just tell us what an area agency on aging even is? Absolutely. And you're not alone. (laughs) So it's not uncommon for professionals or older adults or family caregivers to have little or no knowledge of the area agencies on aging, which is a shame because we've been around for a long time. We are supported by the federal and state governments. We were created by legislation back in the 1960s, the Older Americans Act. And that legislation created this nationwide network of service agencies known as Area Agencies on Aging. And we kind of laughingly refer to ourselves as the other AAAs. So <laughs> we're not the folks who are going to, you know, fix your car battery (laughs) when you find that it doesn't start. But we are a source of information. We provide direct services to older adults, family caregivers, and we work with community partners as well. One of the exciting things about us is we do cover the entirety of the nation. There are 662 area agencies on aging or AAAs that cover all 50 states as well as the U.S. territories as well. So one of the things that we'll talk about this morning is the services do vary between states and even from one part of the state to the other. But again, it's an incredible system of information and services for older adults, family caregivers. And since we are supported by the government, we are able to provide very important services at no cost to those who qualify. Okay. I just have to like, no one could see this, but when you said that the area agencies on aging had been founded in the 1960s, my jaw literally dropped. How, how is it? And of course, you may not 
know the answer to this question necessarily. It's, it's almost like a rhetorical question, but how is it that more people don't know about the incredible resources at their disposal when it's been around for so long? That's just like, that's mind boggling to me. That's a great question. And I think that relatively low level of awareness results from several things. So one of the challenges is area agencies on aging may have different names in different communities. So in some communities, it's a AAA and some it's a council on aging. The programs are funded by the government to provide lots of services, but they are government programs and not deep pockets when it comes to advertising. So most people will learn about the services through word of mouth. I mean, you won't see paid TV ads or, you know, you won't see ads in your local newspapers in most cases. The other phenomenon that that happens quite a bit is we work through local providers. A lot of times people are really familiar with the local providers. And I'll give you an example. Nationwide, the program that reaches the most people is the Home Delivered Meals program, usually known as Meals on Wheels. And if you approached 100 people in your community and said, is there a Meals on Wheels program, most people would probably say, yeah, I've heard of that. If you approached 100 people and said, have you heard of your area agency on aging, you'd probably get, huh? (laughs) So again, we tend to be behind the scenes. We're, We're administering the grants. We're setting up the network. But that doesn't mean that folks would actually recognize us by our agency name. They would be more likely to recognize us through our local partners. Wow. Okay. So that really does help to kind of explain why people may not have have heard of something like an area agency on aging. If y'all are really, you're sort of behind the scenes funding local partners who are really out there providing the services. In some states, we do provide a lot of services directly as well, but I would say the majority of the work is done through those local partners. Okay. Can you give some examples of maybe some support services or some ways that family caregivers might benefit from being in contact with their local area agency on aging? Absolutely. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about some of the services that need to be provided by all area agencies on aging, and then I'll also give you an idea of some services that can be offered by an area agency on aging on the basis of local needs. And, you know, as you noted in your introduction, I've been working in Texas for a long time, and I am more familiar with Texas AAAs than I am in other states. So again, it's just important to keep in mind that the services can vary between states. And again, they can they can also vary within communities. But in terms of the required services that all area agencies on aging must either provide or support through contracts would include information, referral, and assistance. So that's a service that, you know, responds to phone calls or emails from people who are looking for health or social services. So we get calls from people who say, oh my goodness, my dad was just diagnosed with dementia. You know, we hadn't seen him for a year, didn't realize what's going on. And now the doctor says that, you know, he requires some help in the home. In some cases, they'll say, oh my gosh, he needs 24-hour care. What in the world am I going to do? And through that information referral program, a professional call taker would walk that caller or the person who sent the email through the options. So we can provide information about uh, nutrition programs, transportation programs. We get a lot of calls from people who are trying to figure out how to pay for services or, or what services exist. And through that program, we just walk people through their options, talking about federal programs, state programs, local programs that might help in terms of responding to those individual needs. In addition to that information and referral program, as I mentioned, the biggest program that we support and most AAA support are the nutrition programs. So We have home-delivered meal programs. 
where people who are at least 60 years old and may have difficulty shopping for food or preparing meals can receive hot, frozen, or shelf-stable meals in their home. We also support a network of congregate meals. And congregate meals are meals that are served in group settings where folks can go and not only receive a meal, but in most cases, those congregate meal sites would have social activities or recreational activities. Sometimes they would have health classes or, you know, dances, field trips. Like I said, good nutrition is really at the cornerstone of the Older Americans Act. And and we put a lot of time and energy into making sure that older adults have access to healthy, nutritious meals. In addition to the nutrition programs, we're all required, um, at least in the state of Texas, to have case management programs. And the case management programs can do different kinds of things. The Area Agency on Aging does have some discretion to determine the kinds of supports that it will provide. But within my Area Agency on Aging in the state of Texas, most of us would do things that include minor home modifications. So if there's someone who has had a stroke or perhaps a hip fracture. And and prior to that, they were doing fairly well, but now may have difficulty getting in and out of their homes. We can build wheelchair ramps, widen bathroom doorways, install grab bars. Some programs would be able to do other modifications in the bathroom. Uh, We buy a lot of medical equipment that's not covered by insurance. So we may be buying elevated toilet seats or transfer benches or shower chairs or installing handheld shower nozzles. Most AAAs in the state of Texas would be able to buy medical equipment and supplies that are not covered by insurance. So we invest a lot of money in things like incontinence supplies and nutritional supplements for folks who, you know, may need, you know, boost or insure in order to get adequate nutrition. Most of us in the state of Texas might offer limited financial assistance, perhaps with utility bills. All of us within the state and most other states as well would be able to pay for temporary services in the home. So if somebody is having difficulty with housekeeping as she's recovering from an illness or injury or personal assistance services or respite services. Those are commonly funded through the area agencies on aging. In addition to those services, most AAAs would provide long-term care ombudsman services. That is a program that's available in all states. In some states, it's actually administered by a state agency rather than an area agency on aging. But the long-term care ombudsman program is federally mandated to advocate for people who are in nursing facilities as well as assisted living facilities and may have concerns or complaints regarding quality of care or quality of life. And the ombudsman, who may be a staff person, may be a volunteer, would work with the resident and anyone else the resident wants involved, perhaps family, perhaps facility staff, friends, in order to resolve those concerns or complaints to the best of their ability. In many states, including Texas, the ombudsman can also kind of counsel people who are thinking about placement and provide information so that they can choose the most appropriate care facility. So they can talk with folks and let them know which facilities participate in Medicare, Medicaid. In most states, they can share quality information as long as it's objective. So the ombudsmen have to be very objective, independent, You know, the ombudsman can't say, Miss Jones, you need to put your mother in facility A. They really have to honor the person's preferences, but can provide really um, helpful information. In most states, the AAAs would offer um, benefits counseling services. And in states where the AAAs don't provide that, there would be another entity, sometimes the state agency, sometimes the Department of Insurance, who would provide benefits counseling. 
And benefits counseling is a service that helps people understand public benefits, primarily Medicare and Medicaid. So the benefits counselors, like the ombudsman, are great sources of objective information. We don't have a vested interest in any health plan or product, but our goal is to help people understand their options. So through benefits counseling, staff and volunteers can help people understand what Medicare covers, what it doesn't cover. They can kind of talk people through the process of deciding whether traditional Medicare or Medicare Advantage plans make most sense for them. And then um, the benefits counselors can also help people choose a Part D prescription drug plan. So in addition to those services that are required, all area agencies on aging have to offer support services for caregivers. The area agencies on aging have a lot of discretion to determine which caregiver support services that they'll fund. Um, But the most common ones would be those case management services that I talked about, um, doing the same kinds of things, helping people access home repairs or purchase medical equipment and supplies. In addition, most AAAs would offer respite programs for caregivers, and respite provides the caregiver a short-term break from their caregiving responsibilities. The respite can look different depending on the needs of the caregiver, the care receiver, but that might involve paying for an agency or a person of, of the caregiver's choosing to come in and stay with the person who requires care while the caregiver is able to you know, go shopping. In some cases, we provide respite to caregivers who they need to receive medical care and they've had to put it off for sometimes months and years um, because there's no one else to kind of step in for them. The respite program can also be used if somebody wants their loved one to go to an adult day activity center or even to do a short-term stay in an assisted living facility or a nursing facility so that they can go on vacation or, again, kind of take care of their own needs. In addition to those services, uh, AAAs have the option of providing counseling to caregivers. And in North Central Texas, that is a benefit that we offer through some of our local partners, such as the Alzheimer's Association. Area agencies on aging also have the option of funding meals for caregivers or, you know, webinars for caregivers. So a lot of variability. But again, what's important to note is that these types of services are available nationwide. Some of the other services that area agencies on aging can choose to support would include transportation services. So many AAAs will contract with local providers to provide trips by vehicles that are equipped with wheelchair lifts, or in some communities, they may contract with public transit providers or I think more and more we're starting to see contracts with, you know, Uber and Lyft and and taxi companies. Area agencies on aging have the option of supporting services such as friendly visitors, exercise programs. So again, a lot of variability, but again, kind of a well-kept secret in terms of services that are available at no charge to those who qualify. Yeah. So I won't lie. I'm almost like overwhelmed by the list of resources and assistance that local AAAs can provide to people. Like it's, it's sort of mind boggling that all that is out there. At the same time, I see that part of the challenge to accessing all of those resources is one, just the biggest is that knowing those things are available, right? And that's, that's the greatest point in having this episode of the podcast today is to help more people understand that these resources are out there and available. But the other challenge is how do we help people to identify, how do we help people to actually find and contact their local AAAs and maybe the the contractors for those AAAs and then also figure out what services are there 
because I think so many people just don't even know what to ask for. You know, when you when you're a family caregiver, when you're sort of overwhelmed with the day to day responsibilities that you have, we don't even know that things are are out there and available. So it's hard to know what to ask for. So, I mean, how would you direct a family caregiver who's listening to this to just even get started? Yeah. And fortunately, since we are part of a nationwide network, there is a nationwide phone number where people could call and based on their zip code or the zip code of the person for whom they care, they would be connected to their area agency on aging. It's actually called the Elder Care Locator. And the nationwide number is 1-800-677-1116. And let me repeat that number. It's 1-800-677-1116. So anyone who's listening to this podcast, if she remembers nothing else, if she can remember or jot down that phone number, that's the best way to get started. Otherwise, as I mentioned, most of our referrals come from word of mouth. We do quite a bit of outreach to healthcare professionals. We've done our best to form relationships with people who would be in a position to make referrals for these types of services. And we find that most of our referrals do come from hospital discharge planners, from social workers at long-term care facilities as people are preparing for discharge. We also get a lot of referrals from home health agencies. But as I mentioned, the programs that tend to be the most visible are those home-delivered meal programs. And chances are, if there is a local home-delivered meal program, odds are, are better than not that that program is receiving funding from the Area Agency on Aging. So that tends to be a good place to get started. I would say if you use um, the internet, you can easily Google Area Agency on Aging. And, you know, if you could enter your, your county and state, you should be directed to the, the appropriate AAA. But again, the, the elder care locator can help in making those connections. Just in case anyone missed that number, don't worry about it. If you look at the description for this episode of Caregiver's Dilemma, that number is included there. So it's it's saved and written down for you guys already. So another thought that comes to mind is really the question of, and this isn't a question, by the way, that I had written down to ask bef- to ask before, but hearing you talk about how many services are available and the fact that it's all available for at no cost to the the consumer who's actually receiving the services, do you all actually receive enough funding to fulfill your mission? That is a great question. And sadly, the answer is no. And although we can serve people who are at least 60 years of age, for many of our programs, the funding is not sufficient to meet the needs of everyone. You know, we would love to modify the homes of all older adults who may have difficulty navigating. Through our information referral and assistance program, we get literally thousands of calls from people who can't meet their basic needs or who need subsidized housing and need it within a week when the wait for subsidized housing may be two, three years. So those calls are really, really frustrating for the person who needs the help. And, you know, we feel their pain and and we get frustrated as well. So there's no question that the resources are not sufficient. And what I've seen over the 25 plus years that I've been with the agency is that the population growth of older adults, it's been phenomenal. It's just exploded. It's consistently been the fastest growing group of the population. And the baby boomers are now at an age where they qualify for services. And over the years, the funding has increased a tiny little bit from year to year. In some years, it hasn't increased at all. And Again, the number of people who qualify for services has just mushroomed. So what area agencies on aging are called to do is establish targeting criteria for their services. 
So we can provide a little bit of financial help to people who qualify for our case management programs. Unfortunately, we can't pay every utility bill or subsidize people's rents, even though we recognize that, you know, that there's, there's a valid need. So what we do is at the local level, we kind of come up with our targeting criteria. So if we get 100 people who are asking for utility assistance and we only have funds for 15 or 20, we have to be fair and consistent about how we make those decisions. So what we do in North Central, and I think AAAs nationwide would do similar kinds of things, we actually look back to the Older Americans Act and In that act, it says you can serve people age 60 and over and family caregivers, but you need to target people who are at risk of running into health problems or, you know, running into a situation where they can't meet basic needs. And specifically, we're asked to target people with greatest economic need. So, Eligibility for our programs is not based on the income alone. Uh, We don't turn anyone away because their income is too high. And, you know, if Jeff Bezos' mom needed a home-delivered meal (laughs) and she otherwise qualified, she could get it regardless of her income. But, But again, we're asked to target people who may be experiencing economic need. We're asked to target those who are frail. And the Home Delivered Meal Program is a really good example of that. You don't have to be low income to receive home delivered meals, but you do have to have some kind of difficulty fixing that meal. Um, In addition, we're asked to target people who live in rural areas, those who may be experiencing Alzheimer's or related dementias, those who may need help with their daily activities, those who may be at risk of going into a nursing home before their time, as well as people who may have limited English proficiency. So depending on the request, uh, the AAA may need to start drilling down and asking some additional questions in order to kind of make sure that they really are serving those people with the greatest need. Unfortunately, as a result of that, not everyone who's going to need help would be able to to access the services. Are there specific criteria that people do have to meet in order to be able to qualify for receiving services, though? So at a very bare minimum, there are age restrictions. So let me kind of go through all of those age restrictions. So the person who needs care must be at least 60 years old to qualify for certain AAA programs. Or if there is a family caregiver who cares for somebody who's at least 60, that person is potentially eligible, even if the caregiver is in her 20s or 30s. In addition, through the caregiver programs, AAAs can provide services to a person who's caring for somebody with dementia, even if both the caregiver and the person who require care are under the age of 60. AAAs also have the ability to serve people who are at least 55 years old and have primary responsibilities for a person under the age of 18 who's not a biological child. And in most cases, we refer to those services as kin care. Most frequently, they're grandparents raising grandchildren. And we're seeing more and more grandparents raising grandchildren, but it's not limited to grandparents. So we could we could serve a 57-year-old aunt who has had to step in and care for minor children. So, however, we wouldn't be able to serve somebody who's 55 and caring for a biological child who's, you know, 17 or 18. In addition, we can serve people who are at least 55 years old and caring for a young adult with severe disabilities. And in those cases, the caregiver can be a parent. So, Let's say there's a 56-year-old woman and she is caring for a 30-year-old with, say, cerebral palsy or Down syndrome if those conditions result in severe disability. And typically, 
severe disability would be defined as somebody, you know, having significant impairment of their ability to care for themselves, to communicate, to kind of function independently. So again, at a bare minimum, the person would have to fall into one of those age groupings for most services. Now, there are some exceptions. The long-term care ombudsman program is a good example of that. If there's somebody who's in a nursing facility or assisted living facility and under the age of 60, the ombudsman program would work with that individual. It would not turn anyone away because they're too young. And with the benefits counseling program, that program can talk with and assist Medicare beneficiaries, even if they're under the age of 60. But again, for most of the programs, that would be the bare minimum. The person would have to meet one of those age requirements. And then again, there may be additional screening criteria or additional eligibility requirements, such as with the home delivered meals in order to qualify. And so I think what I would maybe encourage listeners to think about, and feel free to correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, Donnie, is that that's so much information and it's a, sometimes it can be hard to figure out, would I qualify? Wouldn't I qualify? I think, you know, maybe again, just start by, if you're not sure, just start by calling that elder care locator number you know, start by reaching out to your local AAA, not for cars, but for area agency on aging Um, (laughs) and, and kind of start there. And there will be experts there who can help walk you through the process. You know, if you don't know what you need, if you don't know if you qualify, but you know that you need help, then it's a good resource to just call that number and get started and find out what is available to you in your area. And, you know, strategically, there there may be an advantage to calling the elder care locator and saying, you know, my mom desperately needs help with, you know, whatever the case may be. Tell me about anything and everything she may qualify for. And then, you know, kind of go through the list and then say, and it's making me crazy trying to help her out. Tell me about anything and everything I qualify for. <laughs> I think that that is such great advice because a lot of times, and that's kind of similar advice that I often have given to people who are trying to access information about like healthcare or medical care or anything like that, is unless you're an expert in some things, it's really hard to even know what might be helpful. So just just calling and giving that, having that general saying, ah, you know, this is so hard. What do you have that might be helpful is, a, I think that's a fantastic piece of advice because you, as someone who maybe is a family caregiver or you're taking care of a friend or a loved one or whatever your situation is, it's not your job to be an expert on every single thing that might help you out. But there are experts out there where that actually is their job. So rather than trying to, you know, maybe like prescribe that for yourself, calling and asking the expert like, hey, this is my situation. What are all the things that you have that might actually be able to help me? I think that's a wonderful, that's gold advice. Keep that in your pocket, everyone. Okay, so Donnie, you've done such a fantastic job giving an overview of the incredible resources that are available, helping people to identify how they can easily get started in the process of getting those resources. And I would also note that anyone listening who is either a legislator or a concerned citizen who wants to make sure that people have access to these resources as much as possible, you know, we it's all of our jobs to advocate for adequate funding for these kinds of resources when we take care of our community, when we have a healthier, stronger community, you know, I'm a real big believer that all boats rise when we make sure that everyone is well cared for and that ultimately we are all end up in a better economic and social and health situation when we, when we care for everyone. So if you're listening to this and you heard about all the amazing resources that these local agencies provide to people across the country and you feel called to, then make sure that you are advocating with your with your lawmakers to make sure that enough funding is going out to these extremely valuable organizations. Thank you so much for that plug. And 
And just to follow up on that, and so the most of the funding is federal in nature. So the federal uh, representatives would be the, the appropriate contacts. Yeah, we were very, very hopeful during the current fiscal year. The, the president had proposed nearly a doubling of the budget for Older Americans Act programs. And as the House and Senate committees were, you know, developing their recommendations, they supported substantial increases. What actually made it through Congress was an increase, but instead of 100%, it was 1.5%. Oh, wow. <laughs> So, um, you know, I was very, very hopeful only to, you know, kind of have those hopes uh, crash and burn. You know, currently we are fortunate. We got some stimulus related funding that allowed us to step up some of our programs, but it will be going away in a few months. And and the last thing we and our providers want to do is have to stop services for people who have been relying on these programs for their health and independence. And then, you know, people will continue to need the services. There's There will be a, a lot of people who are growing older who may be, you know, needing some short-term or, or long-term assistance. And we definitely want to be able to uh, support their their needs as best we can. Well, I really want to thank you so much for taking the time to be on this episode of The Caregiver's Dilemma. I mean, this is really incredibly valuable information for people. And I I really hope if you're listening to this, if you found it valuable, please make sure that you are, that you're sharing out, of course, the podcast, but make sure you're sharing out this episode for people, because these are really things that we should all know about. And whether or not we're using it right now, it's something that we should be advocating for in our communities. Because at one point or another, these kinds of needs will touch us all. And we want to have that foundation in place for our fellow citizens and, of course, for our own friends and family and loved ones. So, Donnie, thank you so much for being here. I do have one more question, though, before we wrap up this episode of The Caregiver's Dilemma. And that is one that I ask every single guest. What is one song that you would recommend for caregivers? That's a great question. And I'm kind of casting about trying to think of something um, inspirational, uplifting. Unfortunately, it's been kind of a a wild and uh, wacky week. So it may fit. You know, I, in addition to being in the aging profession, I've been a caregiver myself. And the song that comes to mind is, uh, I believe it's the Ramones, I Want to Be Sedated. (laughs) (laughs) I think... Oh my gosh, that might be one of the most appropriate songs that anyone has ever suggested. And I mean, it's just, you know, sometimes that's how we all feel. And there's nothing wrong with that. Actually, there's nothing wrong with it. Everyone, when you when you wrap up listening to this episode, go over to your Spotify or your CD player or whatever, however you play music and fire up some Ramones. And have yourself a little dance party there and blow off some steam. That's what a fabulous, what a fabulous song suggestion. Thank you again, Donnie, so much for being here. Um, Y'all, that number again, it will be in the description of this episode, but I'll give it to you one more time for the Elder Care Locator. It is 800-677-1116. Again, that's 800-677-1116. And I hope that you all enjoyed this episode. I hope that you got a lot of value from it. Until next time, y'all, take care. Thanks again to our wonderful guest. And thanks for listening to this episode of The Caregiver's Dilemma. For additional resources on how to provide care for a loved one, visit higherstandardscaregivertraining.com. That's higherstandardscaregivertraining.com. Listeners can save 50% on their membership fee using the promo code caregiversdilemma. Until next time, take care.